Blessing, what a blessing. Well, you we could take your Bibles and go with me to John in chapter 6. John in chapter 6. <clears throat> Be praying for Stephen and Raina Lidberg. This is Stephen's last Sunday here with us, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they're going to be moving to Tennessee in the next month here. I think Raina's got a few weeks left with us. And so and we like her better anyway, Stephen. And so, no, you, if you get a chance after the service, you let Stephen know you love him and praying for him and praying for them as they, they move down to Tennessee and uh, hold them up for the Lord. It's good to have uh, Dean and Carol Gress back today. Dean was, of course, in the hospital a couple weeks ago. and. Uh, he's back today, and he's looking good. I stopped up to see him yesterday, Brother Joel Gerlach and I did, and uh, Carol answered the door, and she said, oh, Dean's, Dean's at a gun auction. So I, I knew Dean was better, and so <laughs> put a big smile on my face, and so thankful for that. And I know Andrew Matern wanted me to mention that he is feeling better as well. He was very hurt that I did not mention him by name on Wednesday night, and so uh, you don't have to say anything nice to Andrew, but I, I wanted to you know, at least let you know. And so I'm teasing, and uh, no, it's good. <laughs> was that was that good enough? No, okay. All right. And Samantha, too. But she's not up here, so you just take credit for both, Andrew. And so, but it's good to have folks back. John chapter 6, let's go ahead and stand together, and we'll do that in reverence to the Word of God. John in chapter number 6, and let's start reading um, with, with verse number 66. John chapter 6 and verse number 66. The Bible says this, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Let's, let's pray. Father, I come to you today, and I'm so thankful for every person, Father, who's been able to take time to come, Lord, to gather together, to assemble together, um, Lord, in your name. Father, I really believe that um, Lord, what's going on in our world today has, uh, Father, you've done it as, as one of the testimonies that was shared. Father, you're in control. You're in charge. This virus hasn't intimidated you or scared you in the least. And Father, you've allowed this to, um, I think, to, to do some pruning in the, in the churches. And Father, I would just, pr I really believe that, Father, what we're here today to do is what you'd have us to. God, I believe we're here today to hear from your word. And I pray that that would be the case, that, Lord, our hearts would be tender, that our minds would be alert, that our ears would be open, and, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God would have free reign, free movement in the hearts and minds of, our, of the, the people here today. Now, God, I would not be so arrogant to assume that everyone here today is, is a born-again child of God. There very well are some who are here today without the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, Father, if there is someone in such a state, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. And Father, for those of us who claim Christ, I pray that we would determine to be mature, fully grown Christians who are able to uh, show Christ to a lost and dying world. Thank you so much. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thanksgiving is a wonderful time. It's a time when we as an American people ought to reflect on what we've been blessed with and, and give thanks to a gracious and a merciful God. Many of us ate entirely too much food in the last couple of days. I know at our house we consumed a lot of food, man. Jacob came home and he said that he hasn't had, you know, hasn't eaten a lot since he's been at college. I think that's a lie, but um, he uh, was able to round back into shape very quickly and consume massive amounts of food. I think it was about 9.30 last night, he went to the refrigerator and made himself a plate of turkey and mashed potatoes and green and bean casserole, just, you know, as a second supper. And so, you know, we, we've consumed a lot of food. I was impressed. I watched him eat every bite and thought, my goodness, I don't know how the man does it. But now things tend to calm down as... The Christmas blitz is about ready to begin. The chapter of John 6 opens with a feast. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's a tremendous miracle. 
really one of Christ's greatest miracles in the sense that it was manifested to so many people. Thousands of people were fed with one boy's lunch. The chapter ends with many of his disciples walking away. In the Christian life, there comes a point or there comes a time when the food is gone. The lights are dimmed. The fun's over. The job loses its luster. And the teaching becomes difficult. At that point, you find out who's really there to stay. As Jesus watched that day, many walked away, never to return. In the last nine months, I've watched as our country and as our church have gone through unprecedented times and uncharted waters. I'll never forget as long as I live the first service back in the auditorium after weeks of virtual services and outdoor services as many eyes had tears in them as we sang together for the first time in months. I've also watched as some have stepped away. They haven't been heard from in months. And this morning, I'm not talking to people who are watching by live stream. I know there's many of you who have not been able to come back for one reason or another, but you get up every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and you anticipate church, and you're ready for church. And I want you to be well aware that's not what I'm speaking of or who I'm speaking of. But there are many who have stepped away. And I was thinking about this and coming across this chapter. And Jesus looked at his 12 said, will you also go away? I believe it's high time for the people of God to declare and cry out, I'm here to stay. Amen. It's time that we let our true colors be known. It's time that we let our real direction be made clear and our intentions, true intentions, be shown. By the way, I will say this before I get into the message. Jesus taught Peter a very valuable lesson here. You cannot answer for others. Peter looked at Jesus and his words that he said were sincere and, and from his heart were 100% true. But Jesus, in verse 70, says, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You can't answer for others. You can't. I can't answer for my wife. I can't answer for my children. They can't answer for me. I can't answer for my, my brothers or sisters in Christ. But I will say this. Answer you must. I'm going to look at this passage, and, and this is our primary text. But I think it's time for God's people to say, I came to stay. Yeah. I came to stay. You see, there's, there are those today who have just walked away. Their Bible is no longer relevant. They may pray over a meal on occasion. Church, if they can fit it in at some point during the week, they may listen to a podcast or watch a, a Facebook post to some extent, but they really don't have much of an interest. And folks, as Jesus watched thousands walk away that day, he said, will ye also go away? Peter, in verse number 68 he answers Jesus and he says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. I came to stay. I came to stay. Number one this morning, I know who I believe in, therefore I stay. I know who I believe in, therefore I stay. Peter professed Christ. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Peter failed. <laughs> Not long after this, Peter fell and made it a complete embarrassment of who he was. But he did get back up again, and he did serve God. So I'm not saying today that you're never going to fail, or you're never going to fa fall, or you're never going to falter. You will. But if you know who you believe in, you'll be able to say, I came to stay. You see, the question, quite frankly, in the last eight and a half months has been asked time and time again, are you here to stay? Will ye also go away? And God's people, as, as Peter of old, need to say, hey, 
hey, Lord, I know who I believe in. I, I believe that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And friend, today I would ask you in, in your life and in, in your heart of hearts, do you know, are you able to profess without shadow of a doubt that he is that Christ? You see, there are many today that, that believe in God. You understand that the Muslims believe in a God. You understand that, that is, uh, Islam has, has a God that refer to as Allah. You understand that the Buddhists have a God or many gods that they believe in. And friend, I'll tell you this. There are many religions that believe in a God, but there is only one religion that claims that Christ is that God. You see, Peter said, I know who I believe in. He said, you're the Messiah, Jesus. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the promised one. You're the one that was given from heaven to take away the sins of mankind. I believe that. And friend, today, if you're sitting here, I would ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is that Christ. You see, there are many Christs that have come into the world. There is the spirit of Antichrist that already is here, and we deal with that on a daily basis, and there are many who will profess a form of godliness, or they'll promise us some sort of religion, but there is only one Messiah. There is only one true Savior of mankind, and I wonder today, as we sit in our seats, and as God looks down from heaven, and He says in a, in a soft, I think a hurt tone, will you all also go away. My prayer is there would be people of God who would say, no sir, thou art that Christ. I know who I believe in and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed on him against that day. I cannot turn back. I cannot quit. I cannot give it up because I know who you are. And friend, today, as I look at the lives of the apostles, th this gripped them. Man, they, they were tortured for their faith. They were killed for their faith, but they could not turn back. And you say, uh, people say, well, well I, the, the, the Jesus story is a myth. Friend, how do you get people to believe in a so-called lie so much where they're willing to undo, endure untold horrors. It's impossible. These men knew who Christ was. They, they walked with Him. They talked with Him. They watched Him be crucified. They saw Him in His resurrected body and they said without a doubt, He is that Christ. And friend, today I would ask you, will He also go away? Or will you boldly declare, I'm here to stay, for I know whom I have believed in. Oh, friend, today, you must know Christ. Know him first as your Savior. Know him secondly as your Lord. Friend, we have a good Savior. We have a good God. And I'll say this, friend, if you're born again, be thankful. Be thankful. But don't stop there. Your God is so much more than a Savior. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is, he is a tower. He is a shield. He is a buckler in a time of uncertainty. He is, he is our defender. He is the lover of my soul. And friend, today, I know whom I have believed in. Therefore, I stay. Secondly, I know why I stand. Therefore, I stay. Peter answered him, to the Lord, to whom shall we go? He said, Jesus, there's no one else that has the answers. <laughs> Peter knew who Christ was. And he also knew there was no one else that had the answers to life and eternity's questions. Friend, do you understand that? I mean, would you just stop for a moment and consider this simple fact? Peter knew why he stood. Friend, this Bible has the answers to life's problems. This Bible has the answer to eternity's questions. And thank God for it. And the Bible says that, that we, are, we are to be ready to give every man an answer of what sort it is, of the hope that lies within us. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the prophet wrote, he said, my people are destroyed for a, a lack of knowledge. And Christian today, there are many who are walking away. And I'll tell you why they're walking away. They do not know why they stand. I'm not saying they aren't saved, but I'm saying they don't know why they stand. They don't know why they got saved. Do you understand that, that God saved you for a purpose? 
He didn't save you to just live your life, to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. He did not save you so you could uh, abuse the grace of God. I, I've grown so weary today as I've watched my generation and a generation following me who have taken the grace of God and have abused it and misused it and said, well, we can live however we want and we can exercise the, the liberties that we have. And friend, that ought not to be. God's people were saved so that we could serve a whole and a living God that's why I stand friend I, there, there's a purpose for why I live a separated life there's a purpose for why I, I, I abstain from the appearance of evil there's a purpose for why I, I, I love my wife and only my wife there's a purpose for why I, I want to raise my kids in a, in a godly and a righteous manner there's a purpose and why I try to keep myself unspotted from the world so I can Serve him properly. You say, Pastor, you, 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 you shouldn't be hard on people. Friend, I'm not being hard on people. I'm telling them the truth. I got saved to serve. You see, when, when Jesus called Peter, he said, Peter, follow me. We want a Christianity today without following the Savior. That's what we want. We want salvation <laughs> that has no service. And God forbid. That thought was abhorrent, by the way, to the New Testament writers. It disgusted them. And friend, may we understand today that I know why I stand. Peter looked at Jesus and he said, to whom, should we, to whom would we go? There's nobody else, Jesus. And friend, today, I'm afraid there's some, some, some younger people in our congregation and they've claimed Christ, but you're looking at the world and you think the world has something to offer you. The world has nothing but death and defilement to offer you. Please listen to me. Listen to your parents, young people. Wake up. You say, oh, the world looks good and it looks tempting and you'll be like the prodigal. You'll go into the world and you'll spend all your substance with riotous living and you'll come back with nothing but scars and regrets. Young ladies, don't chase the first idiot that pursues you. I'm serious. I'm so weary. You know what a godless man wants? And it blows my mind, but he wants a godly girl. He wants a good girl. That's what that jerk wants. And young men, you be careful of the temptress. You be careful of that strange woman. Young men, you're stupid. All right? I was there once upon a time. All right? Men are ignorant, they're blind, and they're fooled by a deceitful woman. You read Proverbs 7, and you see that young man void of understanding, and that's so true of young men. Young men, don't, don't think about the ramifications. We get caught up, and, and, and young men, you listen to me. You know why you stand. Young lady, you know why you stand. You know why you remain pure. There's a purpose that God has for your life, and, and listen to me. If you've fallen, and you, you've fallen into, into fornication or, or into sin, I, I want you to know that you got a good God that loves you and, and cares for you and he'll restore you and he'll, he'll make you what only he can but I want you to listen to me today we have too much of this foolishness that says well I can live however I want I can do whatever I want and Peter looked at Jesus and said to whom would we go there's nowhere else to go you're the one that has the words of eternal life oh, friend <laughs> if you were dying of cancer and there was one man there was one doctor who could cure your cancer would you go to other doctors? Well, I'm going to try some other doctors, Doc. I, I know you can cure me. I know it's what you're famous for. You're world-renowned because you can cure this cancer every single time without fail. But I'm going to try somebody else. Could you explain that reasoning to me? You can't. And yet that's exactly what we do when it comes to walking with God. Well, God, I know you have all the answers and you can save any soul and every soul if they'll only come to you and you can make every life matter for all eternity and make it the most that it could ever be, but I'm going to try something else. What? I know why I stand. Therefore, I stay. You see, today we've gotten caught up in foolish things. We've become socially wise and biblically illiterate. We're consumed with the culture wars and have forgotten that we're soldiers in a spiritual battle. 
I know why I stand. Therefore, I came to stay. Thirdly, this morning, Peter, he says, thou hast the words of eternal life. Several years previous to this, Peter was a fisherman. Peter and Andrew, and I think to some extent they worked with James and John, although I cannot be 100% sure of that. They were businessmen. And Jesus came walking down the shores of Galilee and looked at them and just uttered two words, follow me. Later on he said, I'll make you fishers of men. (laughs) The Bible says they forsook all and followed him. Thirdly, I believe Peter said, I'm willing to pay the price, and therefore I came to stay. I'm willing to pay the price, therefore I stay. I'm going to make a statement, and I don't want you to take me wrong. Please give me your attention for a few minutes, and you'll see what I'm trying to say. But friend, today our Christianity is cheap. My salvation is not. My salvation is precious, so precious it took the blood of a, of a God to save me. It cost Christ his life and God his only begotten son. But our Christianity in many cases has cost us very little or nothing. Therefore, when the food is gone, the lights are dimmed, the fun is over, and the teachings become hard. We're gone. You see, somebody else paid the price. Somebody else provided the food. Somebody else set the table. It cost you nothing. We sing hymns that he is so precious to me. Really? Jesus talked in Matthew about a man who found a pearl of great price and sold everything that he had to buy the field that had that pearl of great price in it. What have we paid for our Christianity? What has my Christianity cost? I get offended and want to quit at the slightest drop of a hat. I I can't even force myself to, to really be invested or be involved in the work or the church of God. We sing where he leads me. I won't follow. I wonder. See, Peter... He counted the cost. He counted the cost. Therefore, he came to stay. Young people, young adults, adults, listen to me. There's a generation that came before us that paid a price. They labored. They worked hard. They invested themselves. They gave of their money. They gave of their time. They gave of their energy. They, they, they built a church. They, they built a building. They reached a community. And, and you've had the benefits and, and, and the grace of God. You've grown up in that. I grew up in that. My, my parents were saved shortly before I was born. And I grew up in Christianity. And I, and I, I didn't have to go through the, the, the rigors of a hard life. I never had to deal with an abusive father and an alcoholic home. I never had to deal with a, a mother who despised me or treated me poorly. I never had to deal with those things. I, I grew up in, in, in a way that I was blessed beyond measure. I had so much and if I'm not careful, I look at my Christianity and it costs me nothing. Therefore when the food is gone and the party's over and the lights go out, I say, well, it's not fun anymore. It's not enjoyable. I'm out of here. I'm going to tell you why. It's because your Christianity to you is cheap. Friend, I'll tell you why some of these older folks don't have any problem coming to church with the coronavirus going on around. They're not coming to church with the coronavirus. (laughs) Got to clarify. All right? Governor, if you're listening. Thank you, Rich. I'll tell you why our older folks come to church amidst the pandemic. Their Christianity costs them something, and it's valuable. And they don't care what the world says. They're going to assemble together because that's what God said. 
and they said, hey, once upon a time, I know who I believed in. And once upon a time, I figured out why I stand. And once upon a time, I paid a high price. Hey, my, my father's family didn't speak to him for years when he got saved and baptized and became a Baptist. He came from a Catholic stronghold, and they thought he'd lost his ever-loving mind. Cost him something. That's why that older crowd, they, they come to church. You know why? This means something. It means it's, it's, it's more than just a service to them. This is a calling. This is a life. This is what, it's a cause. It's what they've invested themselves in. In my generation and the generation following, listen to me. You make sure you get invested in this cause of Christ. Because there's going to come a day. And we're dealing with that day even now. But the food's going to be gone. The lights are going to go out. It's not going to be a party anymore. The miracle isn't going to be happening. The lesson that Jesus is teaching is going to be hard. He teaches on the bread of life and they're, dis they're disgusted with Jesus. They say, we're done. And Jesus turns. He said, will you also go away? And Peter says, Lord, whom would we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Friend, I'd ask you today, will you also go away or have you come to stay? Let's go and stand to our feet. Friend, in just a moment, we're going to take time and the piano and the organ are going to play. And friend, I would ask you if you're here today, do you know for sure that heaven's your home? Do you know that you've believed on Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? You say, oh, I'm a good person, friend. You, you're not a good person. You might be in your own eyes, but friend, you've fallen short of the glory of God. And you're under condemnation of a holy, perfect, righteous God. And God doesn't play games. He sent his only begotten son that you, so that you could be born again. You could receive eternal life. It's a gift. Christ paid it all. What a blessing. But friend, you have to have a point and a time in your life. I had the privilege to sit down several times this week with people and Take them through the gospel and say, you've got to have a time. Well, I always grew up in church. <laughs> Me too. But you've got to have a time. Friend, if you're here today and you've never, you don't have a point in your life where you say, that's, that's when I went from darkness to light. That's when I went from death unto life. That's when I went from lost to found. Friend, you've got to get that settled. You've got to get that settled. I beg you. And then Christian friend, if you're sitting in here today, Will you also go away? You say, oh, I, I, I'm here, and I'm thankful. And, and quite frankly, you being here says something. It does. There's some good reasons socially to stay home. I know, I know, we're, we're dealing with it. I understand that. But friend, you're going to have to deal with this again. Maybe not the coronavirus, maybe not a pandemic. But you're going to have to deal with something in your life again, and you're going to, have the question asked, will you also go away? My friend, I, my prayer is that you declare I came to stay. I know whom I have believed. I came to stay. I know why I stand where I stand. I came to stay. I know what it costs. And I'm willing to pay the price. Friend, today, I beg you. As you just begin to play, friend, if the Lord's laid something on your heart, you come to the altar. And friend, if you're here today and you're without Christ, I just beg you to raise your hand or come forward and get my attention. I'll not embarrass you, but I want to have someone show you from the Word of God how you can be saved. If you're in such a state, friend, please, during the invitation, do that. As you just begin to play. <laughs>